Our first talk of this session is going to, Sergio is going to tell us some more about quantum supremacy. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to talk about the uh, same thing that John talked about this morning, which is great because he explains it much better than me. So hopefully you'll understand it. And this is work with a lot of collaborators who have done a lot of work. Sergei Isakov, Vadim Smeliansky, uh, Ryan Babus. Mrs. Melianski, who happens to be Vadim's brother, Nandine, San Yang, John Martinez, and Harmut Nevin. So uh, what we're interested in is uh, what John Preskill in this paper in 2012 called quantum supremacy. And our interpretation of quantum supremacy is we want to, with a quantum device, we want to perform a well-defined computational task which is beyond the capabilities of state-of-the-art classical supercomputers, and we want to do this in the near term as, as soon as possible as a matter of fact, which implies that we're going to have to do this without error correction, unfortunately. And one uh, condition we're not necessarily implying is uh, we're not going to necessarily solve a practical problem, and as a matter of fact, in this talk, we're not solving a practical problem. So uh, there are several approaches to try to do this. Uh, of course, one of them is uh, the optimization of a classical function, so quantum annealing, which is what this conference is about. Also uh, related to that, but not the same, is uh, the algorithm by Eddy and collaborators, this quantum approximate optimization algorithm. So here, you would like to achieve quantum supremacy by finding a lower minimum of some classical cost function that uh, with a quantum device, a lower minimum that you could do with a supercomputer. Uh, there is also a non-simulable Hamiltonian evolution, which is popular in ion traps, for instance. Uh, the variational quantum eigensolver. Uh, basically, the task of this algorithm will be to find the ground state energy of a Hamiltonian, like a Fermi Haber of uh, some molecule. And the algorithms are going to be talking about, they are sampling algorithms. And the, the computational task here is going to be to sample from a well-defined distribution. So there are examples of this in the literature, like commuting quantum circuits uh, by May Brenner and collaborators, Boson sampling by Aaron Sonner or Kipov. And we're just going to be thinking about sampling the distribution, which is defined by the output of a random universal circuit. And there are several reasons why we focus on this problem. Uh, one of them is we probably want to do this anyway. So as John builds up uh, larger circuits, we want to test how well the circuits are performing. Uh, so this is related to randomized benchmarking. So what we're going to be doing is, in a sense, randomized benchmarking for complex circuits, so not just uh, two qubit gate or single qubit gates, but randomized benchmarking of very complex circuits. Uh, another reason to do this is just pragmatic, because uh, I think this is probably the first thing we can do where we can achieve quantum supremacy, although you know, quantum annealing is on the run, too. And uh, this task might sound a bit strange that we're doing a sampling problem, although, of course, Monte Carlo's algorithms are also designed to solve sampling tasks. But here, the distributions are a bit different. And in random universal circuits, Although it's a slightly artificial distribution, it's actually related to universal quantum computation. So as I said, it's related to benchmarking, and it's probably a distribution we want to sample anyway. So there are several uh, requisites, we believe, for uh, trying to show that you achieve quantum supremacy in the near term. Uh, so one thing we think is necessary is that uh, for your computational task, because this is going to be near term, with high fidelity qubits, but not that many qubits. We want to have a computational task, which you can only try to solve classically through a direct simulation of the quantum evolution. Because uh, if you try to do a direct simulation of the quantum evolution, there's going to have a cost exponentially in the number of qubits, which means with 50 qubits, it's already going to be uh, too expensive for a supercomputer. Two to the 50 is just a very large number. And so the cost of other simulation is exponential in the size of Hilbert space. And uh, this right away 
reminds us of chaotic systems. So in chaotic systems, typically, if you want to uh, get a high precision representation of the final state of a chaotic evolution, classical or quantum, you're going to need to simulate the chaotic evolution. In the quantum case, this is also true and is compound by the exponential dimension of Hilbert space, as uh, John was explaining this morning with the speckles in the laser. So uh, I th we think you need a, a specific fear of merit. So you need to be careful when you're claiming you are achieving quantum supremacy, and you need to, to really try to prove as, as well as you can that you really are performing this task well. So you need uh, an, a specific figure of merit that tells you how well you're performing this computational task. And uh, at least we should be able to measure this figure of merit at the quantum supremacy frontier, meaning, and this will become clear later, if the only way you can perform the computational task classically is by doing a, a simulation of the, of the evolution, of the quantum evolution, then probably once you are beyond the quantum frontier, so you cannot do this simulation anymore, it's going to be very hard to actually compute directly the figure of merit for the computational task, and that's the case at least as far as we know for these sampling problems. Uh, but it turns out that this figure of merit is going to be naturally related to fidelity. So that will allow us to estimate the figure of merit uh, in an independent way and will give us more confidence that we're doing what we claim to be doing. Uh, so because we cannot directly measure the figure of merit beyond the supremacy frontier, we need to understand well how to extrapolate the figure of merit. And uh, it's very helpful to have predictions from theory for what this figure of merit will be beyond the supremacy frontier, and that, again, is related to fidelity. And one uh, thing that we like is if there is a relation to computational complexity, well, then that is good because computational complexity, at least asymptotically, gives you very strong arguments that there are no efficient algorithms for these tasks. And that's the case for random circuits. Uh, and that's a new result. But to really... Um, satisfy the more formal requirements of computational complexity, which is to really violate the strong church training thesis, if you heard of that, uh, because computational complexity makes asymptotic statements. As far as we can tell, that will require a correction. So we're not going to formally satisfy the requirements of computational complexity. We're not going to be able to say we're violating the strong church training thesis due to finite size. But results in computational complexity give us more confidence that there are no efficient algorithms for the tasks that we're trying to do. So what is the problem we have been studying? Well, we're just going to be doing a, we're going to be sampling the output of a universal random circuit. So uh, the reason is that if you have a circuit where you're selecting your gates randomly and you initialize in some state and then you measure that within the computational basis, if you trace the evolution of the quantum state through the different cycles of these circuits, because the gates are random and it's a universal set, this is going to give you a chaotic evolution. So this is related to quantum chaos, and that tells you that probably the only way to do this is by simulating the circuit itself. Uh, the, the task is going to be sampling from the output distribution, which is just the probability of measuring bit strings in the computational basis, or any other local basis, but computational basis will do. And the, the cost of doing this thing is, because you have to do a direct simulation, is basically exponential in n, but the, but the rest simulation I'm generically implying not, methods which are like tensor network contractions or extensions of Clifford circuits. And by tensor network contractions, that means you need the depth uh, in 2D, which is going to be order of square root of n for the cost to be order n, if you're familiar with that method. And as I said before, this is going to be a good benchmark for quantum computers, and we have some new results in computational complexity. So the experimental proposal itself is uh, what John explained this morning. It's simply this. We're going to, we have a particular layout of two qubit gates that we can apply. It's going to be 2D. And we're going to choose some universal set of gates. In our case, it's going to be control C gates for the two qubit gates. And uh, for single qubit gates, we have T, which is non clear for square root of X and square root of Y. And we're just going to select a, a particular instance of the set of random circuits that we can implement. We actually well, Sergey did a lot of numerics optimizing these random circuits so they convert to the chaotic regime as soon as possible. So that's why they have, there are some rules, but they are mainly random. In particular, they give you chaotic states. And once you select an instance, you keep that instance, and you're going to do a large number of measurements in the computational basis with the same circuit. So John mentioned this morning doing around 100,000 measurements 
obtaining around 100,000 bit strings in one second. That would be good enough. So once you have a sample of bit strings, which are, they're going to be all different from each other because this state is chaotic and it's very delocalized. You're not going to see the same uh, bit string in the computational basis twice. You have to do something with it to check if you're sampling approximately from the circuit you claim to be sampling. And what we're going to have to do is we're going to compute these quantities, the log of the probability according to the circuit that I got whatever bit string I found in the experiment. So this is the main limitation. These quantities, you're going to have to calculate them. You, you cannot get them from the circuit. You're going to, you know, it will require an exponential number of measurements to estimate these, and they won't be the ideal probabilities either. We're just going to get these probabilities with a supercomputer. So we use a supercomputer and any simulation method, like tensor neural contraction or just the direct Schrodinger simulation of the circuit, to really, for all the bit strings that we find in the experiment, calculate these real numbers. They're just real numbers. And once we have these numbers, then we calculate uh, this quantity here, which is really the cross entropy, which is just the average of these numbers that they got from the supercomputer, where the sum here is over the bit strings that I obtained in the experiment. And then we normalize it in this way. Uh, and there is some variation, which basically comes from the central limit theorem of order one over the square root of the number of measurements. So with a million measurements or 100,000 measurements, you really are going to obtain a good estimate of what this number is, alpha. And this is really the cross entropy for reasons that I won't have time to get into today. But hopefully, the paper will be in the archive soon, so you can read about it if you want. Uh, so we're going to measure this for a bunch of circuits of different size, of different depth, and with different number of T-gates. So these are related to three different simulation methods that we can do. And then uh, after the point where we cannot do any simulations anymore, we're going to hopefully obtain very nice scores for these numbers. They should decay exponentially in size, depth, and number of T-gates if you keep the other gates constant. And that's going to allow us to extrapolate this cross entropy beyond the point where we cannot measure it anymore. So that's one thing we need to do to be able to claim quantum supremacy, to, to be able to say we're try, doing something that a classical computer cannot do. And the other thing we want to do is we want to fit this to theory. And theory says, well, the reason why we normalize it that way is the interesting story that this cross entropy is really a fairly good estimate of the fidelity of the circuit. The reason is that the chaotic state is very sensitive to errors. So any errors in the circuit will completely destroy, or almost completely destroy, this cross entropy. So with this normalization, the cross entropy should really just be the fidelity of the circuit, which you can estimate by multiplying the fidelities of your different gates, including initialization and measurement fidelity. So that's where this equation comes from. It's just a very crude estimate of the fidelity, which actually works quite well. It, you see the later paper by Rami, for instance, you will find that estimate there uh, for experiments with up to 1,000 gates and 9 qubits. It seems to work well. So this is the layout of what we want to do. And I guess you're going to have to believe me that uh, this particular quantity, the cross entropy with this normalization, really is a good estimate of the fidelity uh, because of the sensitivity of the chaotic stake. And these constants here, they just come from chaos theory or random matrix theory. So they're universal constants up to uh, up to variations of 1 over the square root of Hilbert space. So one thing I'm going to show you, uh, I won't go through the equations, but I'm going to show you some numerics. So uh, the first thing I wanted to show you, I'm going to be running out of time in a hurry, <laughs> is uh, I guess this is the main plot. So this is all I'll explain. I guess we're not too bad. So this quantity, this axis here is the number of qubits. We're keeping the depth fixed to 25. That's because at that time, tensor network contraction will have a hard problem. And we're deep into the chaotic regime. And we plot numerically uh, this cross entropy. So those are the squares for different error rates of the two qubit gates. And these are the poly error rates of the two qubit gates. So if there is no error, the way I normalize it, you should have a cross entropy equals to 1 by normalization. And that's indeed what we see all the way to 42 qubits. So these simulations between uh, 36, 42 qubits that were done in a supercomputer by Mrs. Melyansky, they are, I think, the biggest simulations of any task that approaches quantum supremacy. And you can see that it converges very nicely to the value predicted by random matrix theory. And then as you 
add errors, then your cost entropy decreases, as it should. And indeed, it's following fairly closely the estimate of the fidelity, which is the dashed line, and this is just the product of the fidelities of all your gates. So the cross entropy is a figure of merit on its own, so you can say it's some kind of fidelity of your circuit, but the standard fidelity, so the overlap of the output with the state you're trying to prepare, should be close to the dashed line, and indeed that's very close to the fidelity. So this also stands uh, randomized benchmarking. So I guess I'll go a bit faster over the next plots. Um, there might be simpler, actually. John saw this plot, and it just tells you that if you drop one single poly error, it basically destroys the distribution that you're trying to sample from. So uh, I'm just ordering the distribution. It will be exponential because it's a chaotic state, so this is called a Porter-Thomas distribution. If I drop one error and I'm just over, over the different locations, then the exponential almost disappears. There is some correlation left because errors at the beginning and at the end are not in the chaotic regime quite. Uh, don't completely destroy the correlations. This is another plot for uh, the T design aficionados or chaos aficionados, uh, where you check, we're checking how many, what depth do you need in these circuits to achieve, uh, to get into the chaotic regime. So with this normalization, we're just measuring the entropy of the output state, and this is, this is just numerics. Uh, for random matrix theory or quantum chaos, this is the value you expect, this dash line, and you see more converging very nicely, so 25 depth which is a constraint that comes from tensor nerve contraction. We're deep into the chaotic regime, which is where we want to be. And um, maybe this will be my final plot, something that also has been studied by a number of people in chaos condensed matter. They call it the participation ratio. Quantum computation, they call it TD science. It's how you, the different moments converge to the chaotic state. And uh, we find, as you will expect by arguments related to uh, diffusion of entropy, that uh, the lower moments here, I'm plotting 10 moments, they all converge more or less at the same time. So again, at that 25, well, the 10th moment, I'm normalizing it, so for a chaotic state, this will be one, so I'm multiplying by a huge number. This is for uh, 42 qubits, so this is two to the 42 to the ninth power. So at this depth, we have this inverse participation ratio normalized. Oh, this is just the participation ratio skews, like 10 to the 19. But when you get to depth 25, it's really like 1.8, so you're really converging very fast, and all the moments converge at the same time. And we extended previous proofs of uh, the complexity of sampling, which are for commuting quantum circuits. Uh, uh, this is a paper by Mick Bremner and all, where they saw that, um, well, they saw what they saw, but anyway, the, the, the proof gets extended to random quantum circuits. So basically, the probability to sample the probability, uh, yeah, the probability of a bit of string, you can represent it as the partition function of a complexizing function. And there is a strong conjecture in complexity theory that you cannot approximate the partition function with an empiracle. And there is a theorem that says that if you could sample uh, classically from this distribution, then you could approximate the partition function, which is a contradiction. So this is what Aram suggested, the difference between approximate counting and exact counting. And from here, you derive a contradiction, which basically tells you that asymptotically there shouldn't be an efficient algorithm to sample these outputs of random quantum circuits, as you will expect. So that's nice. And I, I guess I should say that uh, for factoring, which you know we have strong evidence, I guess, historical evidence that there is no classical algorithm, but this is, I guess, a more formal proof. So um, how am I doing on time? Like, yeah. So I read the conclusions or leave it there. <laughs> okay. So my conclusions. Uh, so we expect to, from the plots I saw, which include errors, I still have mentioned that the, one of the lines in that plot, which is still give you a measurable uh, cross entropy of around 0.1, we should really be able to measure that more or less corresponding to state-of-the-art fidelities in the Santa Barbara lab. So we expect, uh, with some work, but we expect to be able to achieve supremacy with uh, circuits of 14 and qubits, which we don't think you can simulate classically anymore, and uh, DEF25. Uh, this cross entropy actually gives us a new method to benchmark quantum circuits because it approximates the fidelity and is in itself a figure of merit that tells you how well your circuit is being implemented. That's also important for us. Uh, there is some interesting relations to chaos and complexity theory. And I think the theory we presented here, the cross entropy, the convergence to chaos, it actually applies to other sampling problems like uh, commuting quantum circuits, boson sampling, chaotic Hamiltonians 
which might be another route to supremacy if you calibrate it properly. And some of it will apply to other sampling problems because the cross entropy is a very general a statistical fear of merit that is used in machine learning, for instance. Thank you. So I guess we have time for a couple of questions. So you have considered random unitary circuits, right? So we're real com complex numbers there. In some yes. If you do the same thing with just a real gates, so you get an orthogonal, orthogonal transform, random orthogonal transformation, mm -hmm. is it easier to see or more difficult to see the difference between the, the classical and the quantum? Uh, so it will give you a different distribution. It will be yes. yeah, slightly different with a slightly different normalization. We haven't really looked into it because it might be easier to simulate. I mean, we have gates with faces, so we are going to use On the that. classical computer is easier to see. Um, the classical computer will be easy, so I guess that's one reason not, not to look into it. But I think the, to your question, which is it will be harder, easier to distinguish, uh, I mean, the statistics will work more or less the same because the distributions are very similar. Your errors will be pretty much the same because the fidelity of the gate probably doesn't depend on having a complex error. If it does, then that would be an interesting finding. Uh, yeah, I guess it would be an alternative to sort of extrapolate. So you use only gates with that complex faces, like mm -hmm. not including T gates is, is one of those ideas. And then you might be able to, to contrast with a supercomputer simulator, then you start putting complex faces. You cannot get the probabilities anymore, but you will think that just by changing the face, the fidelity didn't go down necessarily. One, one more here. How random does it have to be when you pick the gates? I mean, how sensitive it is that if you're, it's not properly random, then it becomes simulatable. You see, like the gates have to be picked randomly, but how close to pure, like properly random it has to be? Well, uh, I guess that's a very generic question, I'm not sure. There are, there, is, there are papers, for instance, if you have only Clifford and then you start adding T gates, uh, you can do up to 50 T gates, for instance. See, the Clifford gates can be as random as you want. That won't give you this chaotic distribution because Clifford doesn't generate chaotic states, at least not you know, the Porter Thomas chaotic states. Um, so you will need at least 50 T gates, if not this similar level. I guess, in general, the intuition is that uh, if it's not chaotic, that means you have some symmetries, and if you have some symmetries, that means there might be a classical algorithm that could exploit those symmetries because you're not like exploring approximately uniformly, not never quite uniformly, but approximately uniformly Hilbert space. If you're not doing that, the computational cost might not be proportional to two to the n because you're not, you know, like spreading enough in Hilbert space. So uh, the more symmetries you have, the, the easier it will be to do a classical simulation. And given that the problem here is the fidelity, we want to try to do this with the least number of qubits and the least depth, that's why we're trying to use circuits which are as spread around as possible, generate the states that are as chaotic as possible if you want. Okay, I think I, I had a question, but I think as session chair, I'm not gonna allow myself to ask it. And um, <laughs> thanks, thanks, let's thanks again.